today I'm going to go over some of my favorite and most used watercolor techniques. There are plenty of videos on YouTube where people show you like the 12 most common techniques or what have you and I'll link some of those either in the cards or through annotations so you guys can find those as well. But I'm really just going to be demonstrating the techniques I use the most. Um, this is part of my ongoing watercolor basics series. You can read more about that on my blog, natosoup.blogspot.com. There's lots of great content up there already in the watercolor basic series from, you know, watercolor essentials designed to get you started to the, the paintbrushes that I recommend as well as my favorite papers. So if you're interested in learning how to watercolor, that is a great place to start. Um, if you're not familiar with my work, I am a children's watercolor artist. I do children's comics and children's book illustrations in watercolor for the most part, although, you know, I also dabble in markers. So today we're starting with a pad of Fabriano Studio watercolor paper. I don't, it, this is not necessarily my recommended paper. It is an inexpensive paper that has um, a decent amount of tooth to it. I actually really like inking on it. and. Um, I figured it would work well for demonstration purposes. We also have a little uh, plastic palette, a variety of brushes, and um, some different watercolors that I'm in the process of vetting. So we have mm, Mission Gold Marine Blue, Turner Cinnabar, uh, Daniel Smith uh, Hooker's Green, uh, Mission Gold Turquoise, and a core watercolor that was sent to me in my art snacks. Now I have many, many more water watercolors and pan watercolors do behave a little differently from tube watercolors. Again, if you check out natosoup.blogspot.com, you can learn more about that. But for the purposes of today, just a quick demonstration. Um, I wanted to keep it kind of simple. I didn't want to get bogged down in too many details. So the very first thing we're going to start out with is just a plain wash. And I am going to be disgusting and use a Sharpie. And I'm going to block off a little area for our wash. And I apologize for my camera setup. My current rig um, is just not working anymore. So I'm using something different and I don't really care for it. I can't get all up in the picture plane. Um, I will have photos of this on the blog though. I know some of these techniques are just best demonstrated live. So we're going to start, I believe, with some marine blue. And I'm just gonna put a little dab right here. Now for large washes, I like to use a mop. And I've written about that. You can also use a flat. I do not have one handy. And this mop is actually, yes I do. I was say that mop's actually a little big for the space. So it's flat. Go ahead, get it going. Take a little bit of the marine blue, mix it thoroughly. And usually I would work with a larger pool of water for a wash. And usually I work either from reconstituted tube watercolors or from pan watercolors. Part of the reason is I find that with two watercolors, the color gets all up in the brush and I can't evenly distribute it. Or you can use a separate brush for mixing. So a wash is pretty simple. You're just filling in the entire area with color. If you have ex excess color like you do up here, you can go over it again like this. And you can also dab up your watercolor using a thirsty brush. That is a brush that is wet, but not sopping wet. And dab it off onto a paper towel to the side, which you guys can't see. So the next thing we wanna do is a gradiated wash or a graduated wash. and it helps to have your paper elevated. Now we're working in kind of an unusual and confined space. So I'm gonna use a roll of masking tape 
to go ahead, prop that up a little bit. And what you wanna do is you wanna take your brush and capture some of the water. And I've always had a hard time for gradiated washes because I tend to get this blooming effect. So what I usually do is I sort of cheat the wash and I do for my watercolor pages on cheap watercolor paper, by the way, um, it, you can get a much nicer effect on nicer paper. So I let that dry a little bit and then I'll go in and do another layer. And if I need to, I'll use clean water to help blend the two layers together. Um, so as with most watercolor things, this does take time. And right now the sheen is a little much because um, some areas are drier, like the corners are drier than the center. So um, the corners are going to take the color and the center is just gonna drop the color straight down basically. It's hot in here though, so it should dry pretty quick. And I may also just not have this at a good angle. And a gradiated wash is really nice for skies. Almost there. So you see right now we have two distinct masses of color. You can clean out your brush and use clean water to help blend the two. Of course, we get a drip right there. You can suck that up very carefully and the area should pull in some of that color. And you can keep layering it to get the depth you want. And this is useful if you use cheap watercolor papers like a cellulose-based paper, which don't handle the same way um, a nicer cotton rag paper would handle. So I'm going to let this dry and then I'm gonna apply another layer to push that gradiated effect. Okay, so my gradiated wash has, you know, it's dry-ish. It's cool to the touch, but not wet. And you can see I got a blossom over there. Sometimes it can be difficult to do these kind of washes in such a small space too. Heating a little bit and adding some more concentrated color to the top. And see how it's kind of buckling? It may actually be difficult for you guys to see how it's kind of buckling. It is kind of buckling. I'm gonna go ahead and get a photo of that. Excuse me if I get in the shot. That's why it is important to stretch your watercolor paper because if this was held tight, the buckling wouldn't be such an issue. When it buckles, it's going, the pigment and the water are going to pull in the low lying areas which is why cheap watercolor papers, especially papers that are both cheap and not stretched, can be very frustrating for people to use. You feel like you just can't control the medium. So um, I'm going to pretty much let that be for the gradiated wash. We're next going to move on to some, some very simple techniques with washes. Okay, so for this next technique, this is very simple, but it is a pretty good way uh, to do clouds very simply. So you wanna do a flatter gradiated wash, but you want your wash to be wet. Show you guys another sort of cheaty way to do a gradiated wash. So we've applied half color, not enough water, and then half water. You tilt it up. Too much half water. We'll just even it out. So take a paper towel and you blot it and you can blot out large shapes. And I use paper towels to help me um, pick up excess area of color, areas of color I don't want all the time. So that is next we're gonna do an add-in I gotta change my camera
unfortunately, I can't pull out and then zoom in so you guys can see this just due to the restrictions on my current camera setup. I apologize. If any of you guys have recommendations for a good camera rig, I would really appreciate it. I had one and it keeps falling no matter what I try with it. So it's time to move on. So this is wash with salt. So we're going to go ahead apply a nice wash and then we're gonna pick up and dab away the excess water so it's damp but not sopping. Then we're gonna take some salt, regular kitchen salt, and sprinkle it in while it's still wet. And unfortunately, I can't zoom in for you guys. Let me see what I can do by rearranging things. There we go. So you can see how it's darker around the salt crystals. Um, the salt absorbs some of the water, which um, in a darker colored wash is gonna have a more noticeable effect noticeable effect and you want to wait until the paper is completely dry to brush away your salt but you don't want to paint further layers on top of the salt while the salt is still there and honestly this is really best if like you're pretty much done with that area you're not going to do other things on top of it okay so last easy wash technique is a wax resist And uh, they sell special wax crayons. These are clear wax. You can use colored wax if you so desire. You can use white wax if you want. Scribble a quick design. And you do that before you apply your color. You can also use it to reserve an area or preserve an area that you are not going to, um, you've already colored and you don't want other color to seep into it. I'll demonstrate that. So we're going to have this area of blue that we want to reserve. So first we apply the color. I just can't move things enough for you guys to see this properly. Sorry about that. Okay, so we've already put our color down we need to let it fully dry and then we're going to put wax on it before we put another layer on it and that's going to reserve this prior layer of color so i'm going to let that dry and i'll get back with you guys all right guys that first layer has pretty much dried so what we're going to do is we're going to take our clear wax crayon and we're going to color over or cover a portion of it now, for best results, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to a completely different color. It's uh, Turner's Cinnabar. Go ahead and get that mixed up. And that, it looks like it's a semi-opaque. I picked up too much blue. I gotta go change my water out. I'll be right back. So, we're gonna take some of this clean, fresh water and mix a little bit of that peachy cinnabar color. And then switch over to our wash brush. Oh, it's not gonna be as uh, noticeable as I'd wanted because cinnabar is a very pretty but light peachy color. Let's try directly from the tube. As you can see, for the most part, the area that had been covered by the wax resist is not taking on any of the color of cinnabar. And after this dries, you can even go in and clean up some of it that some of the paint that's sitting on top of the, the wax. The last thing I'm going to demonstrate with a wash takes pretty much the most time, at least for me, and that is using masking. I'm going to go over masking fluid and masking frisket in more depth over on the blog at a later date, but I figured it's worth mentioning, albeit briefly. So this is some schminky blue uh, masking fluid. 
and I am applying it to completely dry paper. And this needs to dry for about 24 hours or so I've been told for best results before you can even apply the first layer of watercolor. And then when you're removing it, the paper needs to have been dried for 24 hours before you can remove it. So for me, it just isn't feasible because it just takes so much time. But I did feel like it was worth demonstrating for you guys. And the fact that I'm using this brand does not mean it's a recommendation. I have not yet found a brand of masking frisket that I like. This was recommended to me. I tested it on Kara pages. It ripped up my Kara pages upon removal, even after following the 24 hour wait periods. Really just don't recommend it. But I thought it, would, it was important to demonstrate it for you guys because there are artists who can and do use masking fluid with success. So we have to give this a really long drying period. All right guys, so while we wait for that masking fluid to cure, um, we're gonna go over a few more techniques that are pretty common. So the first we're gonna go over is wet into wet. And that is, you know, one of the, the big four that every watercolor artist is gonna use at some point. And I know that's upside down <laughs> for some of you guys, I'm sorry. So wet into wet is when you apply one color into another while they're still wet. And there'll be, or there should be some blending going on. It's pretty stationary right there. Next is going to be dry into wet. So with that, it's, it's kind of a misnomer because you've got a very wet area of color and then you're gonna take a clean brush and get a lot of water out of it and get just like the merest bit of color. We're going with hooker's green here. And the neat thing with watercolor, the neat slash scary thing with watercolor is it often doesn't look like how you put it down. See how the pink has really merged into the blue over here and the green has really spread out. So next we're doing dry into dry. And with that, we need to put down an area of color and then let it dry fully before we do our next layer. And I'll go ahead and prep wet into dry. All right, so I'll check in with you guys when both of these swatches have dried out. So for me, the dry into dry techniques are some of, the, dry into dry and wet into dry are two of the most common techniques I use uh, they often fall into the category of glazing where you're applying a very thin layer of paint over another thin layer of paint. So uh, I'm gonna demonstrate a couple of different, let's see if I can push that up, a couple of different ways you can go about your dry to dry. First we have a thin glaze. So it just adds a little bit of the hue or a tint really. And the intent isn't to scrub or apply so much water that it reactivates. It's just to add a layer of color on top of a color you already have. It's how I build up um, form. Now you can also, oh, that was supposed to be dry and dry. So, <laughs> all right, ignore that. I did that wrong. Um, that was wet into dry, clearly. Um, dry into dry, so you're going to take a very um, watered, a very dry application of your color. Sorry. Using very little water. So that would be more dry into dry. 
you can get drier than that. And you're gonna start getting like a dry brush effect. Let me use this. So it needs to be wet enough to pick up the color. Wish I hadn't done that now. But see, when the brush is sufficiently sufficiently dry, you get all of these like kind of sparkles. Those are the valleys in the paper. The more um, texture your paper has, the more of those sparkles you're going to get. Now we'll go over to the wet and to dry. I apologize again. Um, and like I said, that is the closest to a glazing technique. Not all colors show up very well. Um, that's a very thin application. A thicker application of the same color, almost like gouache, is going to stand out a little bit more. But with dry and to dry, you'll get distinct edges, whereas with wet and to, uh, with dry and to dry, you'll get distinct ed edges. With wet and to dry, you'll get distinct edges. With wet into wet, you're not. There's gonna be a very subtle but hard to control blend. With dry into wet is gonna be the same thing. And of course, you can then opt to sprinkle some salt maybe. That works really well for the wetter applications. Or you could have masked certain areas out. Um, really, at this point, it's mostly a combination of uh, combining various techniques. You can use a razor blade to scrape off areas of color. That's a technique I really don't use very often, if ever, because I work with very cheap paper. And cheap paper can only take so much. Um, with cheaper paper, wet into wet or dry into wet techniques, do you can only go so far with that. You can only do so many of those before the paper starts getting really muddy because it can't hold all those pigments and they start to slough off. If you want to do um, like a scafito or a scraping techniques or um, the wet into wet, dry into wet, I recommend a higher quality cotton rag paper over a cellulose based paper. So you're gonna have to up your game, find a nicer paper um, for those kind of techniques. Anyway, that was a very basic demonstration with one goof up of, um, oh, no, I'm still waiting. I still have to let this completely dry. So I will check in with you guys probably this evening when my masking frisket has dried. So I'll see you guys in a while. All right, guys, so it's been several days and my masking fluid should have dried. So I'm going to go ahead and add a layer of wash over it to help demonstrate how this works. I'm just reconstituting uh, the blue, I think it was the turquoise blue. So we're gonna put it on nice and thick. And then we have to let it dry for another 24 hours before we can remove it. So I will see you guys tomorrow. All right, guys, we have one last part of uh, this demonstration, and that is to remove the frisket. You can use your finger. You can also use a frisket pickup. This frisket is dried for more than 24 hours. So um, we do have a large spot that's a little bit problematic. Gonna go ahead and remove it by hand and use the frisket pickup, I guess, to get it started. So far, so good. We only applied one layer of um, paint over this frisket and everything's had plenty of time to dry. So, so far, I'm not getting any um, of the tearing or the, the ripping that I was getting on my Kara pages. It's a pretty clean removal. And you guys can see that it does an excellent job of masking. This is, you know, stark white against the blue of the watercolor. So these are some of the most basic techniques you're going to use if you're doing watercolors for illustration or watercolors for comics. Um, if you guys have any questions, please let me know either in the comments or by sending me an email. And you can find information on how to contact me by checking out the info section of my blog, www.natosoup.blogspot.com. Um, 
this is not intended to be all inclusive. So ideally I will link some other useful, um, informative videos in the annotations. So check that out. And I will also link some other opinions on the blog. So keep an eye out for that. As I stated at the beginning of the video, this is an installment in my ongoing watercolor basics series. And you can find more posts on that again at the blog. Um, so if you enjoyed this video, if you learned something, if you found it helpful, please do me a favor, leave a like, consider subscribing to my channel for even more art education content. content. Um, if you really like this video, uh, it would be a huge favor to me. I would really appreciate it if you went ahead and shared it to your social networks. There are several handy buttons underneath the video that'll enable you to do that. Your good word means the world to me and I'm trying to grow my audience. So you sharing my content with your friends and your family exposes new people to my work, educates new people. So it, I see it as mutually beneficial. You look good because you shared something interesting and informative with people who care about it. They learn something new and I get a larger audience. I think we can all benefit from that. If you'd like to help fund future art educational content like this video, head on over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash natosoup for more information on how to join the natosoup community and what your money goes to. Um, I'm Becca Hilburn. I hope you guys had a great day. I look forward to seeing you again. Bye.